Cromwell Street, Gloucester, England. An ordinary house in an ordinary street. Number 25 was the home of a local builder and his wife, bustling with children and topped up to the brim with lodges. The only thing that distinguished number 25 from the others was the amount of people that came and went. Fred West liked company. He also liked to maim, molest and murder. But was this seemingly ordinary man driven to the slaughter of at least 12 women and children, or was Fred West born to kill? Fred West was described by Richard Ferguson, prosecuting QC at the trial of Rosemary West, as a man devoid of compassion, consumed with sexual lust, a sadistic killer, and someone who had opted out of the human race, the very epitome of evil. But who was Fred West? If you passed Fred West in the street, you wouldn't give him a second glance. He had a wife and had six children. Fred West was a chameleon. His neighbours would have told you that he was a very hard-working, likeable, friendly chap. On the face of it was a completely ordinary builder, handyman, a very jovial fellow who got on well with everybody. He did fit in. With, with the normal flow of life, even though he was profoundly abnormal. Many people would be taken in by him because he was plausible and charming. So the last thing in your mind is that he might actually uh, harbor terrible evil. The great mystery of the whole thing is what drove them to do this? You're talking about two people who literally have plumbed the depths of human depravity. Some people have the ambition to, you know, to become a great politician, to, to succeed in the world of art. He had the ambition to succeed in sadistic sexual homicide. You could put on this act as a an amiable row, but it was only to put up some kind of disguise. And underneath that lurked this monster. Someone may have evil written all over his face, and yet people miss it. Fred West's evil would be missed by very many people. Frederick Stephen West was born on the 29th of September, 1941, in the rural Hereford village of Much Markle. A tiny agricultural community cut off from metropolitan life, this rural idyll would be where the young West grew up. The second of six siblings, Fred was a striking child with a shock of curly blonde hair and piercing blue eyes. But how did this blue-eyed boy turn into one of history's most vicious and heinous serial killers? For 
For Frederick West, this kind of landscape, obviously, you can see a sense of freedom. And he will have had a lot of freedom, more freedom than most people would have had. But then again, this kind of landscape is also very brutal. And what goes with it is the kind of activities he had, such as clubbing to death rabbits, um, to watch his mother shotgunning um, rats. This kind of, like, physical and uh, very kind of um, harsh environment. It is widely believed that Fred's father, Walter, was a child abuser, and he seemed unashamed and unrepentant about his behavior. Fred was very much the apple of his mother's eye, and her love could be described as more than overprotective. Apparently, for years, they'd been having sort of sexual games together, and the minute he was capable of doing anything more than that, um, she initiated him. He was also abused by his father. Um, it was a family in which incest was taken fairly much as normal. He was highly sexualized from a very young age, and sex became very much part of his motivation. He would talk constantly about sex. Fred's school career was short and unproductive. He left school at 14, barely able to read and write. His IQ was later measured at just 80. The problem there obviously lies that lots and lots of doors are then closed and the doors that were open to Fred and his industrious, possibly attention deficit, hyperactive um, traits uh, would be channeled into things like chasing girls, petty theft, um, problematic behaviour, little petty acts of violence and, and uh, possibly other activities that we don't as yet know about. This would have turned him into a survivor, a lad that would live off the land, crude, get by as I can, get what I can, that he would be like a fox. And he didn't need good uh, literacy skills to survive. He could survive on his wits. Like many young boys, West became fascinated by motorbikes. He saved hard to buy his first machine, but his pride and joy was soon to become a nightmare. On the evening of November the 28th, 1958, whilst West was riding along this road, he collided with a girl riding in the opposite direction. The precise details of the accident remain a mystery, but West suffered multiple injuries, including a serious head wound. He lay unconscious in hospital for seven days. Like many unfortunate children, Frederick West did inherit certain brain abnormalities from his parents who had problems themselves. This reached a very much of a crescendo uh, on this very road which not only caused great damage to his body and the shortening of a leg, um, but delivered a massive amount of damage to his head and therefore to his brain. And the part of the brain that gets the head-on um, particular damage is the frontal cortex here, the frontal lobe, uh, which contains the elements of what makes us a moral person that will give you a sense of revulsion if that is a particularly horrific act. Now, for Fred, these were damaged. So someone who was already a little bit psychopathic suddenly had the brakes taken off completely and made him into a real danger to society. Fred's recovery was slow and humiliating. His nose was broken, he walked with a pronounced limp and now suffered from violent mood swings. He, he did lose a lot of his good looks. There was damage to his nose um, and, and other configurations. And from being quite a, a charmer and a, and, and, and a crudely uh, good-looking lad in the village, um, he, he lost a lot of that edge. Fred compensated for the loss of his looks by taking a much more aggressive approach with the local girls. If Fred wanted sex, he effectively would, um, would rape young girls in that community. It would have been very much a kind of grab and grope uh, situation and he tended then obviously to use girls uh, for the only kind of comfort that really ever existed for Fred in his entire life and that was sex and control. One girl Fred couldn't control was Catherine Costello, better known as Rena. She was a 16-year-old prostitute who had moved to Gloucester from her native Glasgow. Fred married Rena despite her being five months with another man's child. I think Fred saw in Rena certain elements of his mother. It was a strong person who would control him, uh, and he was put in his place, if you like, for the first time probably in his life by a female. Um, but I don't think he was ever comfortable with her. He, he was never really some, someone that he could um, see as a soulmate. She was really a mother substitute. 
Charmaine West was born in the March of 1963 and was soon followed by a little sister, Anne Marie. Childhood for the two little girls was far from traditional. Rena and he had a very on and off life together. Sometimes they were together, sometimes they weren't. Sometimes he had both the children, sometimes these children were in foster care. Occasionally, Rena took the children. Mostly, if they weren't in care, they were with Fred. Fred found a succession of young women to look after them. It was a very um, up and down, strange life. This turbulent relationship finally reached breaking point in 1965. Rena feared for her own safety and fled back to Scotland. Fred had been happy to let her go, but not the children, and he'd already recruited 16-year-old Anna McFall to act as their nanny. Anna McFall, Fred always maintained, was the, in his words, the love of his life. In fact, uh, when he was in prison awaiting trial before he committed suicide, he wrote a great big sort of... Um, catalogue uh, of his relationship with Anne McFall, um, which he entitled, um, I Loved an Angel. But the angel was soon to fall when she became pregnant with West's child. She became effectively a problem to, to Fred, an obstruction who had to be removed. And it sounds extraordinarily callous, but um, Fred was the kind of man who, if a woman presented a problem, uh, she effectively would be removed from his life. Anna McFall was last seen in the July of 1967. Fred West would have thought that people were disposable because as far as he was concerned, other people were instruments uh, to be used. So there would be no ethical boundaries. He decided that he'd had enough of her and that uh, she was surplus to his requirements, and as cold-blooded as this may seem, he destroyed her and buried her. 27 years later, the remains of Anna McFall were discovered in this field on the outskirts of Fred's home village, Much Markle, in Herefordshire. The body had been decapitated and dismembered and was found with the skeleton of her unborn child. He would not have had the same sense of revulsion that you and I would have had uh, of stripping the body and um, deciding how to dispose of it. He would be very industrious about this, and this would have set him apart from many, many attempted killers and attempted serial killers in that he was very energetic, very industrious about the way he went about things. Anna McFall had been the last of the victims to be recovered, but she had been the first to die. She'd signaled a turning point in the murderous career of Frederick West. Fred West was just 12 years old when, in November 1953, a young girl was born who was destined to be his partner in life and in death. The young Rosemary West's childhood was tragically similar to that of Fred. Her mother, Daisy, suffered from both severe depression and the attentions of a violent schizophrenic husband. Her father was very, very abusive to his daughters, and uh, the other daughters wouldn't tolerate it and moved out. In fact, I think the mother moved out at one stage. But from an early age, he would have been having sex with her, and she would be accepting it. The relationship with the father continued after Fred and Rose got together, and in fact, Rose's father would turn up at Cromwell Street, even after Rose had four children, to have sex with her, and then Fred would send her into the bedroom with Anne-Marie. When Fred met Rose, he recognised what one might call a soulmate, and that's why he was attracted to her. They had a kind of interlocking uh, psychopathology and background, so that uh, they played off each other and their fantasies coincided, probably. Fred and Rose met in the quiet village of Bishop's Cleeve, Gloucestershire, England. Despite the age gap, they soon started a relationship, and it was not long before 17-year-old Rose was living with Fred and his two children, Charmaine and Anne-Marie in their new home at 25 Midland Road, Gloucester. That the two gelled sexually, um, probably almost from the off, really, probably saved Rose her life to start off with. I think she could have easily become another victim. She 
she's using him for what she wants, a little perks. He's driving around in his car, and she's feeling much older. She can tell her girlfriends at school or wherever it is, or my, my boyfriend's older. All the time learning from Fred, who was a willing teacher and enjoying every minute of it. This was the cocktail that was going to start to put the bomb together that would soon explode. Rose was soon pregnant and gave birth to Heather Ann in October 1970. Motherhood didn't come naturally. This was something very, very new to Rose. She was very young. However, she did like children, but possibly not in the way that most adults would like children. For Rose, um, she'd always had a kind of learning disability and a slight intellectual challenge. And she found it much easier to sort of deal with small children. Um, and she didn't like the kind of conflict of being challenged. So therefore, she would treat children more as kind of dolls, toys. Um, they were kind of still objectified. I remember asking her whether she ever breastfed. And she said, oh, no, tits were for fucking, not for, you know, breastfeeding children. So, you know, there was this thing that made me wonder about, uh, you know, a mother's milk. It was something alien to, to Rose. Rose was a very, very strict disciplinarian for all the, the West children. Their upbringing was uh, very, very regimented. They were taken off to school. Uh, they were never, ever encouraged to, to make friends in the, the community. Rose ruled the, the West children with, a, with an iron rod. Tragically, the child that suffered the most was eight-year-old Charmaine. Sometime in the June of 1971, while Fred West was coming to the end of a nine-month prison sentence for theft, Charmaine disappeared. Once Rose had killed Charmaine, then she is, of course, equally guilty. So she could not claim just to be an unwilling accomplice once she's done that. She has to continue. This was, as it were, a shared experience. It is incredibly bonding, but um, in this case, bonding in immorality, because having disposed of a problematic, challenging child, uh, which might have disrupted the relationship between Fred and Rose, then, as it were, nothing could be ruled out in terms of eliminating other factors that could threaten their relationship. One of these factors was Charmaine's real mother, Rena. She came looking for her child, and that, I'm afraid, sealed her fate because she could not find... Charmaine was not there. Charmaine was dead. The only solution was to murder Rena. Rena was last seen alive in the autumn of 1971. Her dismembered remains were found in Letterbox Field in Much Markle. Anna McFall already lay next door, degraded and discarded by West. For Frederick West, this will have been his little playground. This would be an area he was very familiar with, an area that he probably played in as a child, and it's an area that he can find readily. It has practical reasons. It has a tree, it has a signpost, and it can be found easily. And he'd want that because he'd want to be able to control these corpses. Um, even though they were not alive, he wants access. He wants to feel that he can actually be part of uh, this area, and they are part of this area. This is his private graveyard. With Rena out of the way, Fred was free to marry, and he and Rose cemented their murderous relationship in the January of 1972. They moved across the park from Midland Road and into a street that was set to become infamous. 25 Cromwell Street became the most famous address in, in the world. It is bedsit land. It's inhabited by a moving population of sort of people who are drifting around or they've left home for some reason or they, they couldn't easily be traced. And that was one of the reasons why Fred remained undetected for so many years. This anonymous neighborhood provided the perfect cover for the West's lustful and murderous nature. It was the ideal lair into which they trapped their prey. Fred and Rose now set about spinning their web. Fred, on his own, was um, a charmer, and he would try and you know, chat people upon street corners and bus stops or what have you. Uh, but having Rose around and having a vehicle 
um, completely puts people at ease. And you can see that they slowly but surely crafted this into a refined, scavenging, predatory, stalking, family sort of unit that could, as it were, take people off the streets very, very efficiently. In November 1972, 17-year-old Caroline Owens was hitchhiking from Tewkesbury to her home in Cinderford. She'd been on a regular visit to see her boyfriend and was waiting for her usual lift from a friendly telephone engineer. It was then that a grey Ford car drew up and a young couple offered her a lift. She seemed pretty cheerful. She, you know, she said, where are you going to? And I said, um, Cinderford. And she said, uh, we're from Gloucester, but don't worry, we'll take you all the way back. They started telling me about their family and asked me if I'd like to be a nanny because they said they had three little girls at home. And I was really excited because I'd always dreamt of being a children's nanny. I loved children. It, that, you know, everything seemed quite uh, romantic and glamorous to me. I was going to escape my home and go and live with this lovely family. And it was like a big fairy tale. Within a week of meeting them, I moved in. But Caroline's fairy tale began to turn into a nightmare when Fred let slip a shocking revelation. One day, he turned around and he said that Anne Marie had lost her virginity. And I mean, she was a little girl of eight. And I didn't think that was a funny thing to say. Uh, and I just said to him quite accusingly, what do you mean? Why, why are you saying she's lost virginity? What's happened to her? And he said, um, well, um, she had an accident on her push bike and the saddle came off and it penetrated her and she was damaged by that. I became a bit aware then. You know, I'd been sexually abused as a child myself. So it was almost like I could now recognise that her behaviour was probably being beaten up by her stepmother and being abused, maybe, by her father. Events got out of hand when Fred propositioned Caroline. He said, well, you know, we've got a sex circle, it's me and Rose and a few other men. Um, we'd like you to join it. And I started getting quite angry, because by this time I got a bit fed up of all the things he used to come out with. And I, I, I said, I don't know what you're on about, don't want nothing to do with it. A disgusted Caroline fled the house, vowing never to return. A couple of months later, she was standing in her usual hitchhiking spot when she noticed a familiar car. My first instinct was to run away, but I didn't. And when they pulled up beside me, uh, Rose was like apologizing. I'm sorry that uh, you left and the children are really missing you. Can we give you a lift home? And as much as I didn't want to, I felt like I couldn't be nasty to them, so I got in the car. It was fine. When we went just through Gloucester. Um, most of it was like the children had missed me, that kind of conversation. Um, and as soon as we got out of Gloucester, going more towards where I live, um, Fred said to me, have you had sex tonight, Caroline? And I went, no. And I was kind of like going, oh, don't start that kind of conversation off again. And he said, oh, go and have a feel, Rose, see if she's wet. And with that, she just like grabbed around down my crunch. We started fighting uh, about two miles outside of Gloucester, past the roundabout. Uh, Fred pulled his car up on the side and out Rose by turning around in his seat and punched me in the side of the head until I was unconscious. When I came round, Fred had the door open, he was on his knees. He'd already tied my hands behind my back with my scarf and he was rocking like parcel tape all the way round and round and round my face as a gag. And they turned the car around and they went back around the roundabout and took me to Cromwell Street. They eventually arrived at the house. Caroline, still bound and gagged, was taken into a bedroom. For the next 12 hours, um, I was beaten. Both of them were like medical examining. It was almost, you know, they were talking about my genitalia and all that as if they were doctors. You know, oh, this is a bit strange, oh, that's so-and-so. I thought they were going to get a knife and just start cutting at me. So I was absolutely terrified, but 
he, he got a, his belt off his jeans and he'd folded it over and was whipping me between the leg with his belt. To be quite honest, at that time, I, I would have been up here off dead. After a night of harrowing abuse, a terrified Caroline was eventually left alone with Fred. I thought he was just going to take me down to the cellar, but he obviously had second thoughts. He just raped me and then he started crying. He said to me, you know, if you promise that you won't tell her I've touched you, he said, and you'll come back here to live, he said, I'll let you go. And of course, you know, considering I thought I was on my way down to the cellar, I was just so relieved and I said, yeah, OK, I'll do that. Caroline had a remarkable escape and went straight to the police. But for Fred and Rose, this signalled a significant change in the balance of their relationship. I think the escape of Caroline Owen owed a lot uh, to the fact that Fred and Rose were still experimenting with sexuality. Now, Fred had already picked up, or at least imposed on the relationship, something that he carried forward from his mother. The idea that it was OK to engage in things if mother approved, uh, but outside of what mother approved, you, it was grab and try and get away with as best you could and make sure she didn't find out. The same applied to Rose, exactly. Rose dictated what went on as far as Fred's sexual adventures were concerned. And hence, most of his actual activities, sexual activities with other people, were hidden from Rose. The Wests pleaded guilty to the kidnap and sexual assault of Caroline. With their victim too scared to give evidence, Fred and Rose were never charged with rape. Fine 25 pounds each. They were allowed to go free. I think the um, the 25 pound fines um, sent a very clear message that even if you do slip up and you make a mistake, that you're really not going to carry the can fully for what you've done. So it sent the signal that providing you make sure that you tidy up, you probably will never get caught. And that just basically sealed the fate of future victims. And then they're hooked on this. It becomes like a drug, you know, and then the more you have, the more you need. They have to make a cold-blooded decision. If we do this again, we can't allow somebody to go away because they'll go to the police and they'll come back again. We have to dispose of the bodies. And Fred already knew about disposing of bodies because he'd, he'd done it before. Having learned a valuable lesson, in future they chose their victims with care. Fred West would have realised that there are plenty of people around who will not be missed. They use the same technique, actually, as uh, certain religious groups that go around finding uh, vulnerable people. They were very good at beginning to spot um, the kind of girl who um, would fall into a category that we kind of use the phrase, less than dead. In other words, someone, if they were killed, disappeared, they would probably be less missed, less noticed, and a lot less police force uh, than the average person, such as prostitutes, runaways, um, girls of very sort of mixed repute, um, who did not have very strong family ties. Once Fred and Rose had selected their prey, they would take them back to Cromwell Street and down into the cellar. The um, events in the cellar, in the, as it were, the chamber of horrors, um, can be only really speculated on, but by bits and pieces that were left over, um, clearly a certain amount of sexual torture and abuse had progressed. These victims may have been stripped and hung and left for long periods of time in extreme pain. Um, you have to remember that uh, Fred, at least, had n very little restraint when it came to the revulsion uh, of what his, his physical acts were. So, you know, to actually inflict almost intolerable, continuous and protracted pain and injury on a person would not have created the same revulsion that it does in you or I. Fred and Rose West had now perfected their mode of operation and over the next 14 years would kidnap, rape, torture and murder almost at will. But each murder would require them to push the boundaries of sadosexual behaviour further and further. She had to be abusive. Um, she had to be in control of the situation. 
and for Fred there had to be, as it were, bizarre episodes of sadism and uh, bondage, etc. They always wanted something more. They want to scream a little bit more. They want to cut a bit deeper. They want. They know what causes more pain than something else. And to be bound and gagged, and poked and stabbed and cut, and beaten, and sexually abused, probably just not even seeing what was going on half the time, with them, these two monsters cackling and laughing, it was the most terrifying experiences beyond human comprehension. Fred and Rose were now sinking to such depths of depravity that it was entirely possible that one of them could end up as the next victim. I think there must have been an absolute element of competition between them that grew up in terms of the other person may kill me. Therefore, I am at risk, therefore I must show myself to be as tough, as sadistic, as hard and as progressively homicidal as the other person. Otherwise, you know, I may be the next victim, as it were, rather than the next perpetrator. <laughs> By June of 1987, Fred and Rose's eldest daughter, Heather, was 16. She'd suffered both physical and sexual abuse at the hands of her parents all her life, and now this teenage girl was becoming a problem. She was murdered one day when the other children had gone to school. Um, there's no evidence or belief that she was sexually abused. She was simply murdered and her body was got rid of in the classic Fred West way and buried under what subsequently became a patio. I don't think for one moment he would have even shed a tear. I think that's how cold-blooded this man was. He was disposing, again, of something that he had no further use for. If Heather had been able to survive and continue, she may have brought the whole facade down one way or another, um, and that could not be allowed. So, to some degree, um, they, they committed, as it were, a very risky murder, a murder that was done to show that they were in control to the rest of their children, and unfortunately, that probably led to their undoing. Heather lay undiscovered under the patio in the garden of Cromwell Street for eight years. Yet the Wests became careless, and her disappearance had become the subject of a sick joke. Fred and Rose would tell the children, you know, to behave themselves, um, otherwise they'd end up under the patio like Heather, which was a macabre joke, you know, obviously, um, looking at the reality of the situation. The persistent rumors about Heather eventually reached the ears of a local policewoman. Detective Constable Hazel Savage had always been aware that there were these rumours and persuaded her bosses that that patio was going to have to be dug up. On the morning of the 24th of February, 1994, a police search team knocked at the door of 25 Cromwell Street and set in motion an investigation that would stun the world. The murderous career of Fred West was about to come to an end. As the police started digging in the back garden of 25 Cromwell Street, they could have no idea of what they were about to find. Fred and Rose West's daughter, Heather, had been missing since 1987, and she was the focus of their search. When they unearthed a female thigh bone, they were confident they'd found what they were looking for. But it fell to pathologist Bernard Knight to break the news to Detective Superintendent John Bennett that there may be more than one body under the patio. And I still remember John Bennett's face when I got down this hole in the garden and looked up and said, either you've got more than one or she had three legs because there were another two thigh bones. I think gobsmacked it <laughs> would fit John's face fairly well at that time because, say, they expected to find Heather. And then I think there were three bodies in the backyard. And then, was it, six in the house? Fred West was arrested. Despite the mounting evidence against him, he seemed remarkably unperturbed. He's a 54-year-old man, then. He's had a long run. He's got away with it all his life. His mindset is one of, you know, I'm probably caught, but who gives a damn now? Um, believing it and not believing it at the same time. Not really fully appreciating the, the enormity of what happened. And it probably took a few weeks before the penny dropped. 
He probably, you know, you know, went to pick up his coat a few times, thinking he was probably on his way home in a few days because, you know, well, they, you know, they found them now and it's not really that important. So therefore, he, he was actually entering quite a, a severe um, sort of state uh, of, of del a delusion uh, where, where he actually didn't think, you know, that, that this, this was that important. Despite West's ambivalence to his crimes, he knew the game was up. He offered to show the police where to dig. He went back to the house and he did indicate certain places where the police might dig in the garden. But he never admitted that there were six other bodies under the house. And uh, there was speculation that Fred didn't want to point that out because he was very proud of his house and how he built it and incorporated various uh, interesting features into it. Uh, he, he didn't think the police would uh, go as far as knocking the house down in order to find evidence. But the police did knock the house down, and after recovering a total of nine bodies from Cromwell Street, they switched their interest to Midland Road, where the body of eight-year-old Charmaine was discovered. A lengthier search of the two fields at Much Markle was to drag on for months, but they were to give up the remains of Rena Costello and Anna McFall. The police now faced the harrowing task of identifying all the victims. Professor Bernard Knight made the startling discovery that the skeletons were incomplete. There's a lot of hand and toe bones missing, but you actually rarely find every bone if you dig up a skeleton. One reason why there may be a sinister aspect is that two babies, two fetuses present, and their tiny little bones were there, most of them, even tiny rib bones, size of a matchstick. And yet there were big, but bigger bones missing from the adults. There's one shoulder blade missing. It's a bit difficult to imagine how, if you can get a tiny fetal bone surviving, where's this big shoulder blade gone? Of course, the, the, the sensational aspect or explanation would be that they were taken off as some form of fetish, and even cannibalism was mentioned, but I mean, I think that's pure speculation but certainly a lot of bones missing. He may have had some bizarre paranoid ideation, so in the beginning, perhaps he was cutting up bodies to make them smaller, taking away the fingers and toes in case they were identified. Um, it could have been, you know, a paranoid state that was superstitious. He had to keep these various little objects close to him so that he knew that he was safe, that he had some control over these dead victims. It may have become a very habitual thing. It is known for for psychopathic killers to keep trophies of their victims. He may have uh, kept one or two bones uh, as kind of mementos in order to be able to keep his uh, work with him. On June the 30th, 1994, Fred and Rose West appeared at Gloucester Magistrates Court, jointly charged with nine murders. It was four months since the police had started digging. Their victims had now been identified as Linda Goff, Lucy Partington, Carol Cooper, Juanita Mott, Shirley Hubbard, Therese Siegenthaler, Alison Chambers, Shirley Ann Robinson, and Heather West. Fred was also charged with a further two murders, that of his first wife, Catherine Costello, and his stepdaughter, Charmaine West. Anna McFall, Fred's first victim, was yet to be identified. This was the first time Fred and Rose had seen each other since their arrest. Fred was devastated when Rose rejected him in court. He would have been distraught. The confidence would have gone. His face would have sagged. Um, he, he would have lost that confident, jovial demeanor. Um, and and he, he had very little else left to live for. Six months later, on New Year's Day, 1995, Whilst waiting to stand trial at Winston Green Prison in Birmingham, Fred West hanged himself. When they told me he killed himself, and they were saying, oh, that's justice, isn't it? And I said, oh, no, it's not really. And I was absolutely gutted. I wanted him to pay the proper price. And he just, like, took his own way out and had his own way about what happened to him. He was in control right to the end. Rose was now left alone to face trial for 10 murders. She was in probably in a bit of a state of shock, actually, I would say. This blanket denial came down, 
and that's pretty well on the whole the way it remained. Rose, at that point, is, is only really protecting one person herself, and that would be her only interest. So she would then progressively try to look as though she was a useful member of society, potentially OK, that it wasn't really her, even if the evidence was against her, and, and that she wasn't that complicit in what went on. But the court thought otherwise, and she was convicted of 10 murders and sentenced to life imprisonment. The investigation was now closed, but had the police found all the victims, rumors persist of many more bodies. We have to regard the kind of dark matter of Fred's life and his, his kind of killing career, if you like, that there are a lot of black spots, which I'm sure may be filled with, with other poor unfortunates who have disappeared and not been registered and not been connected with the Wests. Uh, there was a young child supposedly killed accidentally when Fred was driving an ice cream lorry in Glasgow. There was a young boy who supposedly committed suicide um, not far from Gloucester. But really, if that had been more carefully investigated, I think they would have been interested to talk to Fred. It is possible, as we know with personality disordered individuals, that their characteristics, both Fred and Rose, would have eased off and perhaps their, their, their interest in this would have, would have slowed a little as they approach middle age and, and as it were they were going into sort of homicidal retirement. But it, the, the chances are there would be other victims, uh, but unfortunately due to the logistics we will probably never know. Twenty-five Cromwell Street was demolished in an attempt to erase the memory of West's atrocities. For Caroline Owens, forgetting her ordeal will not be so easy. They've took it all down now and turned it into this walkway. Some people wanted a garden of remembrance, but others thought it wouldn't be respected as such. So they decided to turn it into a walkway. And now I'm actually walking where the ice was. Um, and some of the girls would have been buried under this area here. And some in the patio over in that area. Um, brings back quite a few sad feelings, bad feelings for me. I don't like being here. Um, I just, I just see it as a grave for all the girls. And, I'm just glad it's all over and they're all out of here. It's almost like you can hear him having his laugh. You can hear him laughing. It's almost him laughing and joking about the patio and stuff. Yeah. It feels like he's still here. I don't think they took enough of this place away. Fred West committed some of the most evil and heinous crimes in history a gruesome and disturbing legacy, but was he really born to kill? Given his basic biological background, at birth, this chap was not going to escape the genetics, the psychopathy, which probably affected his brother as well. Um, he was not going to ex escape the family environment, which was going to reaffirm these characteristics that were already in the parents. You have to look back and say, basically, um, that his crimes, to some degree, were inevitable. The degree and, 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 and the frequent nature of the crimes may have been adjusted by aspects of his life, but indeed, Fred was born with the characteristics that would make it reasonably easy for him to turn into a killer.